Hello, creeps. Another lovely Sunday. Doc back at ya. Here to give you another lovely story. Now this one is a recording that we made probably about six or seven months ago. It's for a story called The Harbor Master by Robert Chambers. And we kind of want to release this on the heels of the latest True Detective teaser trailer, which looks very exciting. Since Robert Chambers' Yellow King, a series of short stories he'd written in the early 1900s, was the basis for the mythology of the Yellow King in the first season of True Detective. So, celebration of a new, hopefully exciting, season of True Detective. Here is Robert Chambers' Lovecraftian short horror story about... Something that may possibly be one of the deep ones from H.B. Lovecraft's universe. I don't know. You be the judge. Enjoy. Because it all seems so improbable, so horribly impossible to me now, sitting here safe and sane in my own library, I hesitate to record an episode which already appears to me less horrible than grotesque. Yet unless this story is written now, I know I shall never have the courage to tell the truth about the matter. Not from fear of ridicule, but because I myself shall soon cease to credit what I now know to be true. Yet scarcely a month has elapsed since I heard the stealthy purring of what I believe to be the shoaling undertow. Scarcely a month ago, with my own eyes, I saw that which even now I am beginning to believe never existed. As for the harbor master and the blow, I am now striking at the old order of things. But of that I shall not speak now, or later. I shall try to tell the story simply and truthfully, and let my friends testify as to my probity and the publishers of this book corroborate them. On the 29th of February, I resigned my position under the government and left Washington to accept an offer from Professor Farrago, whose name he kindly permits me to use. And on the first day of April, I entered upon my new and congenial duties as General Superintendent of the Waterfowl Department, connected with the Zoological Gardens, then in course of erection at Bronx Park, New York. For a week, I followed the routine, examining the new foundations, studying the architect's plans, following the surveyors through the Bronx thickets, suggesting arrangements for water courses, and pools destined to be included in the enclosures for swans, geese, pelicans, herons, and such of the waders and swimmers as we might expect to acclimate in Bronx Park. It was at that time the policy of the trustees and officers of the zoological gardens neither to employ collectors nor to send out expeditions in search of specimens. The society decided to depend upon voluntary contributions, and I was always busy part of the day in dictating answers to correspondents who wrote offering their services as hunters of big game, collectors of all sorts of fauna, trappers, snarers, and also to those who offered specimen for sale, usually at exorbitant rates, to the proprietors of five-legged kittens, mangy lynxes, moth-eaten coyotes, and dancing bears, I returned courteous but uncompromising refusals, of course. First submitting all such letters together with my replies to Professor Farrago. One day towards the end of May, however, just as I was leaving Bronx Park to return to town, Professor Lassard of the Reptilian Department called out to me that Professor Farrago wanted to see me a moment. So I put my pipe into my pocket again and retraced my steps to the temporary wooden building occupied by Professor Farrago. General Superintendent of the Zoological Gardens. The professor, who was sitting at his desk before a pile of letters and replies submitted for approval by me, pushed his glasses down and looked over them at me with a whimsical smile that suggested amusement, impatience, annoyance, and perhaps a faint trace of apology. Now here's the letter, he said with a deliberate gesture towards a sheet of paper impaled on a file, a letter that I suppose you remember. He disengaged the sheet of paper and handed it to me. Oh yes, I replied with a shrug. Of course, the man is mistaken or... Or what? demanded Farrago, tranquilly, wiping his glasses. Or a liar, I replied. After a silence, he leaned back in his chair and bade me read the letter to him again. And I did so with a contemptuous tolerance for the writer, who must have been either a very innocent victim 
or a very stupid swindler. I said as much to Professor Farrago, but to my surprise he appeared to waver. I suppose, he said, with his nearsighted embarrassed smile, that 999 men in a thousand would throw that letter aside and condemn the writer as a liar or a fool. In my opinion, said I, he's one or the other. He isn't. In mine, said the professor placidly. What? I exclaimed. Here is a man living all alone on a strip of rock and sand between the wilderness and the sea who wants you to send somebody to take charge of a bird that doesn't exist? How do you know? asked Professor Farrago. That the bird in question does not exist. It is generally accepted, I replied sarcastically, that the great auk has been extinct for years. Therefore, I may be pardoned for doubting that our correspondent possesses a pair of them alive. Oh, you young fellows said the professor, smiling wearily. You embark on a theory for destinations that don't exist. He leaned back in his chair, his amused eyes searching space for the imagery that made him smile. Like swimming squirrels, you navigate with the help of heaven in a stiff breeze, but you never land where you hope to. Do you? Rather red in the face, I said. Don't you believe the great auk to be extinct? Abaddon saw the great auk. Who has seen a single specimen since? Nobody. Except our correspondent here, he replied laughing. I laughed too, considering the interview at an end, but the professor went on, coolly. Whatever it is that our correspondent has, and I am daring to believe that it is the great arc itself, I want you to secure it for our society. When the astonishment subsided, my first conscious sentiment was one of pity. Clearly, Professor Farrago was on the verge of dotage. Ah, what a loss to the world. I believe now that Professor Farrago perfectly interpreted my thoughts, but he betrayed neither resentment nor impatience. I drew a chair up beside his desk. There was nothing to do but obey, and this fool's errand was none of my conceiving. Together we made out a list of articles necessary for me and itemized the expenses I might incur, and I set a date for my return, allowing no margin for a successful termination to the expedition. Never mind that, said the professor. What I want you to do is to get those birds here safely. Now, how many men will you take? None, I replied bluntly. It's a useless expense, unless there's something to bring back. If there is, I'll wire you. You may be sure. Very well, said Professor Farrago, good-humoredly. You shall have all the assistance you may require. Can you leave tonight? The old gentleman was certainly prompt. I nodded, half sulkily, aware of his amusement. So... I said, picking up my hat. I am to start north to find a place called Black Harbor, where there is a man named Halyard who possesses, among other household utensils, two extinct ox. We were both laughing by this time. I asked him why on earth he credited the assertion of the man he had never before heard of. I suppose, he replied, with the same half-apologetic, half-humorous smile, it is instinct. I feel, somehow, that this man Halyard has an ox. Perhaps two. I can't get away from the idea we are on the eve of acquiring the rarest of living creatures. It's odd for a scientist to talk as I do. Doubtless you're shocked. Admit it. But I was not shocked. On the contrary, I was conscious that the same strange hope that Professor Farrago cherished was beginning, in spite of me, to stir pulses too. If he has... I began and stopped. The professor and I looked hard at each other in silence. Go on he said encouragingly, but I had nothing more to say, for the prospect of beholding with my own eyes a living specimen of the great auk produced a series of conflicting emotions within me, which rendered speech profanely superfluous. As I took my leave, Professor Farrago came to the door of the temporary wooden office and handed me the letter written by the man Halyard. I folded it and put it in my pocket, as Halyard might require it for my identification. How much does he want for the pair? I asked. Ten thousand dollars. Don't demur. If the birds are really- I know, I said hastily, not daring to hope for too much. One thing more, said Professor Farrago gravely. You know in that last paragraph of his letter, Halyard speaks of something else in the way of specimens. An undiscovered amphibious biped. Just read the paragraph again, will you? I drew the letter from my pocket and read as he directed. When you have seen the two living specimens of the great auk, and satisfied yourselves that I tell the truth, you may be wise enough to listen without prejudice to a statement I shall make concerning the existence of the strangest creature ever fashioned. 
I will merely say at this time that the creature referred to is an amphibious biped and inhabits the ocean near this coast. More I cannot say, for I personally have not seen the animal, but I have a witness who has, and there are many who affirm that they have seen the creature. You will naturally say that my statement amounts to nothing, but when your representative arrives, if he be free from prejudice, I expect his reports to you concerning the sea biped will confirm the solemn statements of a witness I know to be unimpeachable. Yours truly, Burton Halyard, Black Harbor. Well, I said after a moment's thought, here goes for the wild goose chase. Wild ock, you mean, said Professor Farrago, shaking hands with me. You will start tonight, won't you? Yes, but heaven knows how I'm ever going to land in this man Halyard's dooryard. Goodbye. Uh, about the sea biped? Began Professor Farrago shyly. Oh, don't, I said. I can swallow the ox, feathers and claws. But if this fellow Halyard is hinting he's seen an amphibious creature resembling a man, or woman, said the professor cautiously, I retired disgustedly, my faith shaken in the mental figure of Professor Farrago. The three days' voyage by boat and rail was irksome. I bought my kit at St. Croix on the Central Pacific Railroad, and on June 1st, I began the last stage of my journey via the St. Isle broad gauge. Arriving in the wilderness by daylight, a tedious forced march by blazed trail, freshly spotted on the wrong side, of course, brought me to the northern terminus of the rusty, narrow gauge lumber railway, which runs from the heart of the hushed pine wilderness to the sea. Already a long train of battered flat cars piled with sluice props and roughly hewn sleepers was moving slowly off into the brooding forest gloom when I came in sight of the track, but I developed a gratifying and unexpected burst of speed, shouting all the while. The train stopped. I swung myself aboard the last car, where a pleasant young fellow was sitting on the rear brake, chewing spruce and reading a letter. Come aboard, sir, he said, looking up with a smile. I guess you're the man in a hurry. I'm looking for a man named Halyard, I said, dropping rifle and knapsack on the fresh-cut, fragrant pile of pine. Are you Halyard? No, I'm Francis Lee, boss in the mica pit at Port of Waves, he replied. But this letter is from Halyard, asking me to look out for a man in a hurry from Bronx Park, New York. I'm that man, said I, filling my pipe and offering him a share of the weed of peace. And we sat side by side, smoking very amiably, until a signal from the locomotive sent him forward, and I was left alone, lounging at ease head pillowed on both arms, watching the blue sky flying through the branches overhead. Long before we came in sight of the ocean, I smelled it. The fresh, salt aroma stole into my senses, drowsy with the heated odor of the pine and hemlock, and I sat up, peering ahead into the dusky sea of pines. Fresher and fresher came the wind from the sea, in puffs, in mild, sweet breezes, in steady, freshening currents, blowing the feathery crowns of the pines, setting the balsam's blue tufts rocking. Lee wandered back over the long line of flats, balancing himself nonchalantly as the cars swung around a sharp curve, where water dripped from a newly propped sluice that suddenly emerged from the depths of the forest to run parallel to the railroad track. Built it this spring, he said, surveying his handiwork, which seemed to undulate as the cars swept past. It runs to the cove, or ought to, he stopped abruptly with a thoughtful glance at me. So, you're going to Halyard's, he continued, as though answering your question asked by himself. I nodded. You've never been there, of course? No, I said, and I'm not likely to go again. I would have told him why I was going, if I had not already begun to feel ashamed of my idiotic errand. I guess you're going to look at those birds of his, continued Lee placidly. I guess I am, I said sulkily glancing askance to see whether he was smiling. But he only asked me, quite seriously, whether a great auk was really a very rare bird. And I told him that the last one ever seen had been found dead off Labrador in January 1870. Then I asked him whether these birds of Halyard were really great auks, and he replied somewhat indifferently that he supposed that they were. At least, nobody had ever before seen such birds near Port of Waves. There's something else he said, running a pine sliver through his pipe stem. 
Something that interests us all here more than ox, big or little. I suppose I might as well speak of it, as you are bound to hear about it sooner or later. He hesitated, and I could see that he was embarrassed, searching for the exact words to convey his meaning. If, said I, you have anything in this region more important to science than the great ox, I should be very glad to know about it. Perhaps there was the faintest tinge of sarcasm in my voice, for he shot a sharp glance at me and then turned slightly. After a moment, however, he put his pipe into his pocket, laid hold of the brake with both hands, vaulted to his perch aloft and glanced down at me. Did you ever hear of the harbor master? He asked maliciously. Which harbor master? I inquired. You'll know before long, he observed with a satisfied glance into perspective. This rather extraordinary observation puzzled me. I waited for him to resume, and as he did not, I asked him what he meant. If I knew, he said, I'd tell you. But come to think of it, I'd be a fool to go into details with a scientific man. You'll hear about the Harbor Master. Perhaps you will see the Harbor Master. In that event, I should be glad to converse with you on the subject. I could not help laughing at this prim and precise manner and after a moment he also left. <laughs> it, it hurts a man's vanity to know he knows a thing that somebody else knows he doesn't know. I'm damned if I say another word about the harbor master until you've been to Halyards. A harbor master, I persisted, is an official who superintends the mooring of ships, isn't he? But he refused to be tempted into conversation and we lounged silently on the lumber until a long, thin whistle from the locomotive and a rush of stinging salt wind brought us to our feet. Through the trees, I could see the bluish-black ocean stretching out beyond black headlands to meet the clouds. A great wind was roaring among the trees as the train slowly came to a standstill on the edge of the primeval forest. Lee jumped to the ground and aided me with my rifle and pack, and then the train began to back away along a curved sidetrack which, Lee said, led to the mica pit and company stores. Now what will you do? he asked pleasantly. I can give you a good dinner and a decent bed tonight if you like, and I'm sure Mrs. Lee would be very glad to have you stop with us as long as you choose. I thanked him kindly, but said that I was anxious to reach Halyards before dark, and he very kindly led me along the cliffs and pointed out the path. This man, Halyard, he said, is an invalid. He lives at the cove called Black Harbor, and all his truck go through to him over the company road. We receive it here, and send a pack mule through once a month. I've met him. He's a bad-tempered hypochondriac, a cynic at heart, and a man whose word is never doubted. If he says he has a great awk, you may be satisfied he has. My heart was beating with excitement at the prospect. I looked out across the wooded headlands and tangled stretches of doom and hollow trying to realize what it might mean to me, to Professor Farrago, to the world, if I should lead back to New York a live hawk. He's a crank, said Lee. Frankly, I don't like him. If you find it unpleasant there, come back to us. Does Halyard live alone? I asked. Yes, except for a professional trained nurse, poor thing. A man? No, he said disgustedly. Presently, he gave me a peculiar glance, hesitated, and finally said, ask Halyard to tell you about his nurse and the harbor master. Goodbye, I'm due at the quarry. Come and stay with us whether you care to. You will find a welcome at Port of Waves. We shook hands and parted on the cliff. He turned back into the forest along the railway. I, starting northward, pack slung, rifle over my shoulder. Once I met a group of quarrymen, faces burnt brick red, scarred hands swinging as they walked. And as I passed them with a nod, turning, I saw that they had also turned to look at me and I caught a word or two of their conversation, whirled back to me on the sea wind. They were speaking of the harbor master. Towards sunset, I came out on a sheer granite cliff where the seabirds were whirling and clamoring, and the great breakers dashed, rolling in double thundering reverberations on the sun-dyed crimson sands below the rock. Across the half-moon of beach towered another cliff, 
and behind this I saw a column of smoke rising in the air. It certainly came from Halyard's chimney, although the opposite cliff prevented me from seeing the house itself. I rested a moment to refill my pipe, then resumed rifle and pack, and cautiously started to skirt the cliffs. I had descended halfway towards the beach, and was examining the cliff opposite, when something on the very top of the rock arrested my attention. A man, darkly outlined against the sky. The next moment, however, I knew it could not be a man, for the object suddenly glided over the face of the cliff and slid down the sheer smooth lace like a lizard. Before I could get a square look at it, the thing crawled into the surf, or at least it seemed to, but the whole episode occurred so suddenly, so unexpectedly, that I was not sure I had seen anything at all. However, I was curious enough to climb the cliff on the land side and make my way toward the spot where I imagined I saw the man. Of course, there was nothing there, not a trace of a human being, I mean. Something had been there, a sea otter possibly, for the remains of a freshly killed fish lay on the rock, eaten to the backbone and tail. The next moment, below me, I saw the house, a freshly painted, trim, flimsy structure, modern and very much out of harmony with the splendid savagery surrounding it. It struck a nasty, cheap note in the noble grey monotony of headland and sea. The descent was easy enough. I crossed the crescent beach, hard as pink marble, and found a little trodden path among the rocks that led to the front porch of the house. There were two people on the porch. I heard their voices before I saw them, and when I set my foot upon the wooden steps, I saw one of them, a woman, rise from her chair and step hastily toward me. Come back! cried the other, a man with a smoothly shaven, deeply lined face and a pair of angry blue eyes, and the woman stepped back quietly, acknowledging my lifting hat with a silent inclination. The man, who was reclining in an invalid's rolling chair, clapped both large, pale hands to the wheels and pushed himself out along the porch. He had shawls pinned about him, an untidy, drab-colored hat on his head, and when he looked down at me, he scowled. I know who you are, he said in his acid voice. You're one of the zoological men from Bronx Park. You look it anyway. It is easy to recognize you from your reputation, I replied, irritated at his discourtesy. Really? He replied, with something between a sneer and a laugh. I'm obliged for your frankness. You're after my great ox, are you not? Nothing else would have tempted me into this place, I replied sincerely. Thank heaven for that, he said. Sit down a moment. You've interrupted us. Then, turning to the young woman who wore the neat gown and tidy cap of a professional nurse, he bade her resume what she had been saying. She did so, with deprecating glance at me, which made the old man sneer again. It happened so suddenly, she said in her low voice, that I had no chance to get back. The boat was drifting in the cove. I sat in the stern, reading, both oars shipped, and the tiller swinging. Then I heard a scratching under the boat but thought it might be seaweed, and next moment came those soft thumpings, like the sound of a big fish rubbing its nose against a float. Halyard clutched the wheels of his chair and stared at the girl in grim displeasure. Didn't you know enough to be frightened? he demanded. No, not then, she said, coloring faintly. But when after a few moments I looked up and saw the harbor master running up and down the beach, I was horribly frightened. Really? said Halyard sarcastically. It was about time! Then turning to me, he rasped out, And that young lady was obliged to row all the way out to Port of Waves and call to Lee's quarrymen to take her boat in. Completely mystified, I looked from Halyard to the girl, not in the least comprehending what it all meant. That will do, said Halyard ungraciously, which curt phrase was apparently the usual dismissal for the nurse. She rose, and I rose, and she passed with me with an inclination, stepping noiselessly into the house. I want beef tea, bawled Halyard after her. Then he gave me an unamiable glance. I am a well-bred man, he sneered. I'm a Harvard graduate too, but I live as I like, and I do what I like, and I say what I like. You certainly are not reticent, I said disgustedly. Why should I be, he rasped. I pay that young woman for my irritability. It's a bargain between us. In your domestic affairs, I said, there is nothing that interests me. I came to see those ox. You probably believe them to be razor-billed ox, he said contemptuously. But they're not. They're great ox. I suggested that he permit me to examine them, 
and he replied indifferently that they were in a pen in his backyard, and that I was free to step around the house when I cared to. I laid my rifle and pack on the veranda, and hastened off with mixed emotions, among which hope no longer predominated. Such precise prizes in a pen in his backyard, I argued, and I was perfectly prepared to find anything from a puffin to a penguin in that pen. I shall never forget as long as I live my stupor of amazement when I came to the wire-covered enclosure. Not only were there two great ox in the pen, alive, breathing, squatting in bulky majesty on their seaweed bed, but one of them was gravely contemplating two newly hatched chicks, all bill and feet, which nestled sedately at the edge of a puddle of salt water, where some small fish was swimming for a while, excited, blinded, nay, deafened me. I tried to realize that I was gazing upon the last individuals of an all but extinct race, the sole survivors of the gigantic auk, which for thirty years has been accounted an extinct creature. I believe that I did not move muscle nor limb until the sun had gone down and the crowding darkness blurred my straining eyes and blotted the great silent, bright-eyed birds from sight. Even then I could not tear myself away from the enclosure. I listened to the strange, drowsy note of the male bird, the fainter responses of the female, the thin plaints of the chicks, huddling under her breast. I heard their flipper-like embryotic wings beating sleepily as the birds stretched and yawned their beaks and clacked them, preparing for slumber. If you please, came a soft voice from the door, Mr. Halliot awaits your company to dinner. I dined well, or rather, I might have enjoyed my dinner if Mr. Halliot had been eliminated and the feast had consisted exclusively of a joint of beef, the pretty nurse and myself. She was exceedingly attractive, with a disturbing fashion of lowering her head and raising her dark eyes when spoken to. As for Halyard, he was unspeakable, bundled up in his snuffy shawls and making uncouth noises over his gruel, but it is only just to say that his table was worth sitting down to and his wine was sound as a bell. Yah, he snapped, I'm sick of this cursed soup, and I'll trouble you to fill my glass. It is dangerous for you to touch the claret said the pretty nurse. I might as well die at dinner as anywhere, he observed. Certainly, said I, cheerfully passing the decanter, but he did not appear overpleased with the attention. I can't smoke either, he snarled, hitching the shawls around until he looked like Richard III. However, he was good enough to shove the box of cigars at me, and I took one and stood up as the pretty nurse slipped past and vanished into the little parlor beyond. We sat there for a little while without speaking. He picked irritably at the breadcrumbs on the cloth, never glancing in my direction, and I, tired from my long foot tour, lay back in my chair, silently appreciating one of the best cigars I ever smoked. Well, he rasped out at length, what do you think of my ox and my veracity? I told him that both were unimpeachable. Didn't they call me a swindler down there at your museum? He demanded. I admitted that I had heard the term applied. Then I made a clean breast of the matter, telling him that it was I who had doubted, that my chief, Professor Farrago, had sent me against my will, and that I was ready and glad to admit that he, Mr. Halyard, was a benefactor of the human race. Bosh! he said. What good does a confounded, wobbly, bandy-toed bird do to the human race? But he was pleased, nevertheless, and presently he asked me, not unamiably, to punish his claret again. I'm done for, he said. Good things to eat and drink are no good for me. Someday, I'll get mad enough to have a fit, and then... He paused to yawn. Then, he continued, that little nurse of mine will drink up my claret and go back to civilization where people are polite. Somehow or other, in spite of the fact that Halyard was an old pig, what he said touched me. There was certainly not much left in life for him, as he regarded life. I'm going to leave her the house, he said, arranging his shawls. She doesn't know it. I'm going to leave her my money, too. She doesn't know that. Good Lord, what kind of a woman can she be to stand my bad temper for a few dollars a month? I think, said I, that it's partly because she's poor, partly because she's sorry for you. He looked up at me with a ghastly smile. You think she really is sorry? Before I could answer, he went on. I'm no mopish sentimentalist. I won't allow anybody to be sorry for me, do you hear? 
Oh, I'm not sorry for you, I said hastily. For the first time since I had seen him, he laughed heartily without a sneer. We both seemed to feel better after that. I drank his wine and smoked his cigars, and he appeared to take a certain grim pleasure in watching me. There's no fool like a young fool, he observed presently, as I had no doubt he referred to me. I paid him no attention. After fidgeting with his shawls, he gave me an oblique scowl and asked me my age. Twenty-four, I replied. Sort of a tadpole, aren't you? He said. As I took no offense, he repeated the remark. Oh, come, said I. There's no use in trying to irritate me. I see through you. A row acts like a cocktail on you. But you'll have to stick to gruel in my company. I call that impudence, he rasped out wrathfully. I don't care what you call it, I replied undisturbed. I am not going to be worried by you anyway, I ended. It is my opinion that you could be very good company if you chose. The proposition appeared to take his breath away. At last, he said nothing more, and I finished my cigar in peace and tossed the stump into the saucer. Now, said I, what price do you set upon your bird, Mr. Halyard? Ten thousand dollars snapped with an evil smile. You will receive a certified check when the birds are delivered, I said quietly. You don't mean to say you agree with to such an outrageous bargain. And I won't take a cent less either, good lord. Haven't you any spirit left? He cried, half rising from his pile of shawls. His piteous eagerness for a dispute sent me into laughter impossible to control, and he eyed me, mouth open, animosity rising visibly. Then he seized the wheels of his invalid chair and trundled away too mad to speak, and I strolled out into the parlor, still laughing. The pretty nurse was there, sewing under a hanging lamp. If I am not indiscreet, I began. Indiscretion is the best part of valor, she said, dropping her head but raising her eyes. So I sat down with a frivolous smile peculiar to the appreciated. Doubtless, said I, you are hemming a kerchief. Doubtless, I am not, she said. This is a nightcap for Mr. Halyard. A mental vision of Halyard in a nightcap, very mad, nearly set me laughing again. Like the king of Yev Tot. He wears his crown in bed, said I flippantly. The king of Yev Tot might have made that remark, she observed, re-threading her needle. It is unpleasant to be reproved. How large and red and hot a man's ears feel. To cool them, I strolled out to the porch, and after a while the pretty nurse came out too, and sat down in a chair not far away. She probably regretted her lost opportunity to be flirted with. I have so little company. It is a great relief to see somebody from the world, she said. If you can be agreeable, I wish you would. The idea that she had come out to see me was so agreeable that I remained speechless until she said, Do tell what people are doing in New York. So I seated myself on the steps and talked about the portion of the world inhabited by me. While she sat sewing in the dull light that straggled out from the parlor windows, she had a certain coquetry of her own using the usual methods with an individuality that was certainly fetching. For instance, when she lost her needle, and another time, when we both on hands and knees hunted for her thimble. However, directions for these pastimes may be found in contemporary classics. I was as entertaining as I could be, perhaps not quite as entertaining as a young man usually thinks he is. However, we got on very well together, until I asked her tenderly who the harbor master might be whom they all discussed mysteriously. I do not care to speak about it, she said with a primness of which I had not suspected her capable. Of course, I could scarcely pursue the subject after that, and indeed, I did not intend to, so I began to tell her how I fancied I had seen a man on the cliff that afternoon, and how the creature slid over the sheer rock like a snake. To my amazement, she asked me to kindly discontinue the account of my adventures in an icy tone, which left no room for protest. It was only a sea otter. I tried to explain, thinking perhaps she did not care for snake stories. But the explanation did not appear to interest her, and I was mortified to observe that my impression upon her was anything but pleasant. She doesn't seem to like me and my stories, thought I, but she is too young, perhaps, to appreciate them. So I forgave her, for she was even prettier than I had thought her at first, and I took my leave, saying that Mr. Halyard would doubtless direct me to my room. Halyard was in the library, cleaning a revolver when I entered. Your room is next to mine, he said. Pleasant dreams, and kindly refrain from snoring. May I venture an absurd hope that you will do the same? I said politely. That maddened him, so I hastily withdrew. I had been asleep for at least two hours when a movement by my bedside and a light in my eyes awakened me. I sat bolt upright in bed, blinking at Halyard, 
who clad in a dressing gown and wearing a nightcap had wheeled himself into my room with one hand, while with the other he solemnly waved a candle over my head. I'm so cursed lonely, he said. Come, there's a good fellow. Talk to me in your own original impudent way. I objected strenuously, but he looked so worn and thin, so lonely and bad-tempered, so lovelessly grotesque, that I got out of bed and passed a sponge full of cold water over my head. Then I returned to bed and propped up the pillows for a backrest, ready to quarrel with him if it might bring some little pleasure into his morbid existence. No, he said amiably, I'm too worried to quarrel, but I'm much obliged for your kindly offer. I want to tell you something. What? I asked suspiciously. I want to ask if you ever saw a man with gills like fish. Gills? I repeated. Yes, gills. Did you? No, I replied angrily. And neither did you. No, I never did, he said in a curiously placid voice. But there's a man with gills like a fish who lives in the ocean out there. Oh, you needn't look that way. Nobody ever thinks of doubting my word. And I tell you, there's a man, or a thing that looks like a man, as big as you are too, all slate-colored with nasty red gills like a fish. And I have a witness to prove what I say. Who? I said sarcastically. The witness? My nurse. Oh. She saw a slate-colored man with gills? Yes, she did. So did Francis Lee, superintendent of the Mica Quarry Company at Port of Waves. So have a dozen men who work in the quarry. Oh, you needn't laugh, young man. It's an old story here. And anybody can tell you about that harbor master. The harbor master? I exclaimed. Yes, that slate-colored thing with gills that looks like a man, and by heaven is a man. That's the harbor master. Ask any quarryman at Port of Waves what it is that comes purring around their boats at the wharf and unties painters and changes the mooring of every catboat in the cove at night. Ask Francis Lee what it is he saw leaping up and down the shoal at sunset last Friday. Ask anybody along the coast what sort of thing moves about the cliffs like a man and slides over the sea like an otter. I saw it do that, I burst out. Oh, you did? Well, what was it? Something kept me silent, although a dozen explanations flew to my lips. After a pause, Halyard said, You saw the harbor master. That's what you saw. I looked at him without a word. Don't mistake me, he said pettishly. I don't think the harbor master is a spirit, or a sprite, or a hobgoblin, or any sort of damn rot. Neither do I believe it to be an optical illusion. What do you think it is? I asked. I think it's a man. I think it's a branch of the human race. That's what I think. Let me tell you something. The deepest spot in the Atlantic Ocean is a trifle over five miles deep. And suppose you know that this place lies only about a quarter of a mile off this headland. The British exploring vessel Go, Captain Marat, discovering and sounded it, I believe. Anyway, it's there, and it's my belief that the profound depths are inhabited by the remnants of that last race of amphibious human beings. This was childish. I did not bother to reply. Believe it or not, as you will, he said angrily. One thing I know, and that is this. The harbor master has still taken to hanging around my cove, and he is attracted by my nurse. I won't have it. I'll blow his fishy gills out of his head if I ever get a shot at him. I don't care whether it's homicide or not anyway. It's a new kind of murder that attracts me. I gazed at him incredulously but he was working himself into a passion, and I did not choose to say what I thought. Yes, the slate-colored thing with gills goes purring and grinning and spitting about after my nurse when she walks, when she rows, when she sits in the beach. God, it drives me nearly frantic. I won't tolerate it, I tell you. No, said I, and I wouldn't either. And I rolled over in bed convulsed with laughter. The next moment I heard my door slam. I smothered my mirth and rose to close the window, for the land wind blew cold from the forest, and a drizzle was sweeping the carpet as far as my bed. The luminous glare which sometimes lingers after the stars go out threw a trembling, nebulous radiance over sand and cove. I heard the seething currents under the breakers soft and thunder, louder than I ever had heard. Then, as I closed my window, lingering for a last look at the crawling tide, I saw a man standing ankle-deep in the surf all alone there in the night. But was it a man? For the figure suddenly began running over the beach on all fours like a beetle, waving its limb like feelers. Before I could throw open the window again, it darted into the surf. 
and when I leaned out into the chilling drizzle, I saw nothing save the flat ebb crawling on the coast. I heard nothing save the purring of bubbles on seething sands. It took me a week to perfect my arrangements for transporting the Great Arcs by water to Port of Waves, where a lumber schooner was to be sent from Petite St. Isle, chartered by me for a voyage to New York. I had constructed a cage made of Aussiers, in which my Arcs were to squat until they arrived at Bronx Park. My telegrams to Professor Farrago were brief. One merely said, Victory. Another explained that I wanted no assistance, and a third read, Schooner chartered, arrived New York July 1st send furniture van to foot of bluff. My week as a guest of Mr. Halyard proved interesting. I wrangled with that invalid to his heart's content. I worked all day on my Aussie cage. I hunted the thimble in the moonlight with the pretty nurse. We sometimes found it. As for the thing they call the harbor master, I saw it a dozen times, but always either at night or so far away and so close to the sea that of course no trace of it remained when I reached the spot, rifle in hand. I had quite made up my mind that the so-called harbor master was a demented foreigner, wandered from heaven knows where, perhaps shipwrecked and gone mad from his sufferings. Still, it was far from pleasant to know that the creature was strongly attracted by the nurse. She, however, persisted in regarding the harbor master as a sea creature. She earnestly affirmed that it had gills like a fish's gills, and it had a soft, fleshy hole for a mouth, and its eyes were luminous and lidless and fixed. Besides, she said with a shudder, it's all slate color, like a porpoise, and it looks as wet as a sheet of India rubber in a dissecting room. The day before I was to set sail with my ox in a cat boat bound for Port of Waves, Halyard trundled up to me in his chair and announced his intention of going with me. Going where? I asked. To Port of Waves and then to New York, he replied tranquilly. I was doubtful and my lack of cordiality hurt his feelings. Oh, of course. If you need the sea voyage, I began. I don't! I need you, he said savagely. I need the stimulus of our daily quarrel. I never disagreed so pleasantly with anyone in my life. It agrees with me. I am a hundred percent better than I was last week. I was inclined to resent this, but something in the deep-lying face of the invalid softened me. Besides, I had taken a hearty liking to the old pig. I don't want any mawkish sentiment about it, he said, observing me closely. I won't permit anybody to feel sorry for me, you understand? I'll trouble you to use a different tone in addressing me, I replied hotly. I'll feel sorry for you if I choose to. And our usual quarrel proceeded to his deep satisfaction. By six o'clock next evening, I had Halyard's luggage stowed away in the catboat, and the pretty nurse's effects corded down with the newly hatched arc chicks in a hat box on top. She and I placed the Aussie cage aboard, securing it firmly, and then throwing tablecloths over the arc's head, we led those simple and dignified birds down the path and across the plank at the little wooden pier. Together we locked up the house while Howley had stormed at us both and wheeled himself furiously up and down the beach below. At the last moment she forgot her thimble, but we found it, I forget where. Come on, shouted Halyard waving his shawl furiously. What the devil are you about up there? He received our explanation with a sniff, and we trundled him aboard without further ceremony. Don't run me across the plank like a steamer trunk, he shouted, as I shot him dexterously into the cockpit. But the wind was dying away, and I had no time to dispute with him then. The sun was setting above the pine-clad ridge as our sail flapped and partly filled, and I cast off and began a long tack east by south to avoid the spouting rocks on our starboard bow. The seabirds rose in clouds as we swung across the shoal. The black surf ducks scuttered out to sea. The gulls tossed their sun-tipped wings in the ocean, riding the rollers like bits of froth. Already we were sailing slowly out across the great hole in the ocean, five miles deep, the most profound sounding ever taken in the Atlantic Ocean. The presence of great heights or great depths seen or unseen, always impresses the human mind, perhaps oppresses it. We were very silent. The sunlight stained on cliff and beach deepened to crimson, then faded into somber purple bloom that lingered long after the rose tint died out in the zenith. 
Our progress was slow at times. Although the sail filled with the rising land breeze, we scarcely seemed to move at all. Of course, said the pretty nurse. We couldn't be aground in the deepest hole in the Atlantic. Scarcely, said Halyard sarcastically. Unless we're grounded on a whale. What's that thumping, I asked. Have we run afoul of a barrel or log? It was almost too dark to see, but I leaned over the rail and swept the water with my hand. Instantly, something smooth glided under it, like the back of a great fish, and I jerked my hand back to the tiller. At the same moment, the whole surface of the water seemed to begin to purr, with a sound like the breaking froth in a champagne glass. What's the matter with you? Asked Halyard sharply. A fish came under my hand, I said. A porpoise or something, with a low cry. The pretty nurse clasped my arms in both her hands. Listen, she whispered. It's purring around the boat. What the devil's purring? Shouted Halyard. I won't have anything purring around me. At that moment, to my amazement, I saw that the boat had stopped entirely. Although the sail was full and the small pennant fluttered from the masthead, something too was tugging at the rudder, twisting and jerking it until the tiller strained and creaked in my hand. All at once it snapped. The tiller swung useless and the boat whirled around, heeling in the stiffening wind, and drove shoreward. It was then that I, ducking to escape the boom, caught a glimpse of something ahead, something that a sudden wave seemed to toss on deck and leave there, wet and flapping, a man with round, fixed, fishy eyes and soft, slaty skin. But the horror of the thing were the two gills that swelled and relaxed spasmodically, emitting a rasping, purring sound, two gasping red gills all fluted and scalloped and distended. Frozen with amazement and repugnance, I stared at the creature. I felt the hair stirring on my head and the icy sweat on my forehead. It's the harbor master! screamed Halyard. The harbor master had gathered himself into a wet lump, squatting motionless in the bows under the mast. His lidless eyes were phosphorescent like the eyes of living codfish. After a while, I felt that either fright or disgust was going to strangle me where I sat but it was only the arms of the pretty nurse clasped around me in a frenzy of terror. There was not a firearm aboard that we could get at. Halyard's hand crept backward where a steel shod boat hook lay, and I also made a clutch at it. The next moment I had it in my hand and staggered forward, but the boat was already tumbling shoreward among the breakers, and the next I knew, the harbor master ran at me like a colossal rat. Just as the boat rolled over and over through the surf, filling freight and passengers among the seaweed-covered rocks. When I came to myself, I was thrashing about knee-deep in a rocky pool, blinded by the water and half-suffocated, while under my feet, like a stranded porpoise, the harbor master made the water boil in his efforts to upset me. But his limbs seemed soft and boneless. He had no nails, no teeth, and he bounced and thumped and flapped and splashed like a fish. While I rained blows on him with the boat hook that sounded like blows on a football, and all the while his gills were blowing out and frothing and purring, and his lidless eyes looked into mine until nauseated and trembling, I dragged myself back to the beach, where already the pretty nurse alternately wrung her hands and her petticoats in ornamental despair. Beyond the cove, Halyard was bobbing up and down, afloat in his invalid's chair trying to steer shorewards. He was the maddest man I ever saw. Have you killed the rubber-headed thing yet? He roared. I can't kill it, I shouted breathlessly. I might as well have tried to kill a football. Can't you put your hole in it? He bawled. If I could only get at him! His words were drowned in a thunderous splashing, a roar of great broad flippers beating the sea, and I saw the gigantic forms of my two great ox, followed by their chicks, blundering past in a shower of spray driving headlong out into the ocean. Oh, Lord, I said, I can't stand that. And for the first time in my life, I fainted peacefully and appropriately at the feet of the pretty nurse. It is still within the range of possibility that this story may be doubted. It doesn't matter. Nothing can add to the despair of a man who has lost two great hawks. As for Halyard, nothing affects him except his involuntary sea bath and that did him so much good that he writes me from the south that he's going on a walking tour through Switzerland if I'll join him. I might have joined him if he had not married the pretty nurse. I wonder whether, but of course this is no place for speculation. In regard to the harbor master, 
You may believe it or not, as you choose. But if you hear of any great ox being found, kindly throw a tablecloth over their heads and notify the authorities at the new zoological gardens in Bronx Park, New York. The reward is $10,000.